Section 9 of Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Around the World on a Bicycle, Volume 1 by Thomas Stevens. Chapter 5 From America to the German Frontier. Part 1. At 1 p.m. on that day, the ponderous but shapely hull of the city of Chicago, with its living and lively freight, moves from the dock as though it, too, were endowed with mind as well as matter. The crowds that a moment ago disappeared down the gangplank are now congregated on the outer end of the pier, a compact mass of waving handkerchiefs and anxious-faced people shouting out signs of recognition to friends aboard the departing steamer. From beginning to end of the voyage across the Atlantic, the weather is delightful, and the passengers, well, half the cabin passengers are members of Henry Irving's Lyceum Company, en route home after their successful tour in America, and old voyagers abroad who have crossed the Atlantic scores of times pronounce it altogether the most enjoyable trip they ever experienced. The third day out, we encountered a lonesome-looking iceberg, an object that the captain seemed to think would be better appreciated, and possibly more affectionately remembered, if viewed at the respectful distance of about four miles. It proves a cold, unsympathetic berg, yet extremely entertaining in its own way, since it accommodates us by neutralizing pretty much all the surplus caloric in the atmosphere around for hours after it has disappeared below the horizon of our vision. I am particularly fortunate in finding among my fellow passengers Mr. Harry B. French, the traveller and author, from whom I obtain much valuable information, particularly of China, Mr. French has travelled some distance through the flowery kingdom himself, and thoughtfully forewarns me to anticipate a particularly lively and interesting time in invading that country with a vehicle so strange and incomprehensible to the celestial mind as a bicycle. This experienced gentleman informs me, among other interesting things, that if five hundred chattering celestials batter down the door and swarm unannounced at midnight into the apartment where I am endeavouring to get the first wink of sleep obtained for a whole week, instead of following the natural inclinations of an Anglo-Saxon to energetically defend his rights with a stuffed club, I shall display Solomon-like wisdom by quietly submitting to the invasion and deferentially bowing to Chinese inquisitiveness. If, on an occasion of this nature, one stationed himself behind the door, and as a sort of preliminary warning to the others, greeted the first interloper with the business end of a boot-jack, he would be morally certain of a lively one-sided misunderstanding that might end disastrously to himself, whereas by meekly submitting to a critical and exhaustive examination by the assembled company, he might even become the recipient of an apology for having had to batter down the door in order to satisfy their curiosity. One needs more discretion than valour in dealing with the Chinese. At noon on the 19th we reach Liverpool, where I find a letter awaiting me from A. J. Wilson, Fayed, inviting me to call on him at Powerscroft House, London, and offering to tandem me through the intricate mazes of the West End, likewise asking whether it would be agreeable to have him with others accompany me from London down to the South Coast, a programme to which, it is needless to say, I entertain no objections. As the Custom House officer wrenches a board off the broad, flat, box containing my American bicycle. Several fellow passengers, prompted by their curiosity to obtain a peep at the machine which they have learned is to carry me round the world, gather about, 
and one sympathetic lady, as she catches a glimpse of the bright nickeled forks, exclaims, Oh, what a shame that they should be allowed to wrench the planks off. They might injure it. But a small tip thoroughly convinces the individual prying off the board that by removing one section and taking a conscientious squint in the direction of the closed end, his duty to the British government would be performed as faithfully as though everything were laid bare, and the kind-hearted lady's apprehension of possible injury are thus happily allayed. In two hours after landing, the bicycle is safely stowed away in the underground storerooms of the Liverpool and Northwestern Railway Company, and in two hours more I am wheeling rapidly toward London, through neatly cultivated fields and meadows and parks of that intense greenness met with nowhere save in the British Isles, and which causes a couple of Native Americans riding in the same compartment, and who are visiting England for the first time, to express their admiration of it all in the unmeasured language of the genuine Yankee when truly astonished and delighted. Arriving in London, I lose no time in seeking out Mr. Bolton, a well-known wheelman who has toured on the continent probably as extensively as any other English cycler, and to whom I bear a letter of introduction. Together, on Monday afternoon, we ruthlessly invade the sanctums of the leading cycling papers in London, Mr. Bolton is also able to give me several useful hints concerning wheeling through France and Germany. Then comes the application for a passport, and the inevitable unpleasantness of being suspected by every policeman and detective about the government buildings of being a wild-eyed dynamiter recently arrived from America with the fell purpose of blowing up the place. On Tuesday, I make a formal descent on the Chinese embassy to seek information regarding the possibility of making a serpentine trail through the flowery kingdom via Upper Burma to Hong Kong or Shanghai. Here I learn from Dr. McCarty, the interpreter at the embassy, as from Mr. French, that putting it as mildly as possible I must expect wild time generally in getting through the interior of China with a bicycle. The doctor feels certain that I may reasonably anticipate the pleasure of making my way through a howling wilderness of hooting celestials from one end of the country to the other. The great danger, he thinks, will not be so much the well-known aversion of the Chinese to having an outer barbarian penetrate the sacred interior of their country, as the enormous crowds that would almost constantly surround me out of curiosity at both rider and wheel, and the moral certainty of a foreigner unwittingly doing something to offend the Chinaman's peculiar and deep-rooted notions of propriety. This it is easily seen would be a peculiarly ticklish thing to do when surrounded by surging masses of dangling pigtails and cerulean browsers, the wearers of which are from the start predisposed to make things as unpleasant as possible. My own experience alone, however, will prove the kind of reception I am likely to meet with among them and if they will only considerately refrain from impaling me on a bamboo, after a barbarous and highly ingenious custom of theirs, I little reck what other unpleasantries they have in store. After one remains in the world long enough to find it out, he usually becomes less fastidious about the future of things in general than when in the hopeful days of boyhood every prospect ahead was fringed with the golden expectations of a budding and inexperienced imagery. Nevertheless, a thoughtful, meditative person who realizes the necessity of drawing the line somewhere would naturally draw it at impalation. Not being conscious of any presentiment savoring of impalation, however, the only request I make of the Chinese at present is to place no insurmountable obstacle against my pursuing the even or uneven, as the case may be, tenor of my way through their country. 
China, though, is several revolutions of my fifty-inch wheel away to the eastward at this present time of writing, and speculations in regard to it are rather premature. Soon after reaching London, I have the pleasure of meeting Fayed, a gentleman who carries his cycling enthusiasm almost where some people are said to carry their hearts, on his sleeve, so that a very short acquaintance only is necessary to convince one of being in the company of a person whose interest in whirling wheels is of no ordinary nature. When I present myself at Powerscroft House, Fayed is busily wandering around among the curves and angles of no less than three tricycles, apparently endeavouring to encompass the complicated mechanism of all three in one grand comprehensive effort of the mind, and the addition of as many tricycle crates standing around makes the premises so suggestive of a flourishing tricycle agency that an old gentleman, happening to pass by at the moment, is really quite excusable in stopping and inquiring the prices, with a view to purchasing one for himself. Our tandem ride through the West End has to be indefinitely postponed, on account of my time being limited, and our inability to procure readily a suitable machine, and Mr. Wilson's bump of discretion would not permit him to think of allowing me to attempt the feat of manoeuvring a tricycle myself among the bewildering traffic of the metropolis, and risk bringing my wheel around the world to an inglorious conclusion before being fairly begun. While walking down Parliament Street, my attention is called to a venerable-looking gentleman wheeling briskly along, among the throngs of vehicles of every description, and I am informed that the bold tricycler is none other than Major Knox Holmes, a vigorous youth of some seventy-eight summers, who has recently accomplished the feat of riding one hundred and fourteen miles in ten hours. For a person nearly eighty years of age, this is really quite a promising performance, and there is small doubt but that, when the gallant major gets a little older, say when he becomes a centenarian, he will develop into a veritable prodigy on the cinder-path. Having obtained my passport, and got it vised for the Sultan's dominions at the Turkish consulate, and placed in Fayed's possession a bundle of maps which he generously volunteers to forward to me, as I require them in the various countries it is proposed to traverse, I return on April the 30th to Liverpool, from which point the formal start on the wheel across England is to be made. Four o'clock in the afternoon of May the 2nd is the time announced, and Edge Hill Church is the appointed place, where Mr. Lawrence Fletcher, of the Anfield Bicycle Club, and a number of other Liverpool wheelmen have volunteered to meet and accompany me some distance out of the city. Several of the Liverpool daily papers have made mention of the affair. Accordingly, upon arriving at the appointed place and time, I find a crowd of several hundred people gathered to satisfy their curiosity as to what sort of a looking individual it is who has crossed America, a wheel, and furthermore proposes to accomplish the greater feat of the circumlocution of the globe. A small sea of hats is enthusiastically waved aloft. A ripple of applause escapes from five hundred English throats as I mount my glistening bicycle, and with the assistance of a few policemen the twenty-five Liverpool cyclers who have assembled to accompany me out extricate themselves from the crowd, mount and fall into line two abreast, and merrily we wheel away down Edge Lane and out of Liverpool. English weather at this season is notoriously capricious, and the present year it is unusually so, and ere the start is fairly made we are pedalling along through quite a pelting shower, which however fails to make much impression on the roads beyond causing the flinging of more or less mud. The majority of my escort are members of the Anfield Club, who have the enviable reputation of being among the hardest road-riders in England. 
several members having accomplished over two hundred miles within the twenty-four hours and i am informed that mr fletcher is soon to undertake the task of beating the tricycle record over that already well contested route from john o'groats to land's end sixteen miles out i become the happy recipient of hearty well-wishes innumerable with the accompanying handshaking and my escort turned back toward home and liverpool all save four who wheel on to warrington and remain overnight with the avowed intention of accompanying me twenty-five miles farther to-morrow morning our sunday morning experience begins with a shower of rain which however augurs well for the remainder of the day and save for a gentle head-wind no reproachful remarks are heard about that much criticised individual the clerk of the weather especially as our road leads through a country prolific of everything charming to one's sense of the beautiful moreover we are this morning bowling along the self-same highway that in days of yore was among the favourite promenades of a distinguished and enterprising individual known to every british juvenile as dick turpin a person who won imperishable renown and the undying affection of the small britain of to-day by making it unsafe along here for stage-coaches and travellers indiscreet enough to carry valuables about with them think i'll get such roads as this all through england i ask of my escort as we wheel joyously southward along smooth macadamized highways that would make the sand-papered roads around boston seem almost unfit for cycling in comparison and that lead through picturesque villages and noble parks occasionally catching a glimpse of a splendid old manor among venerable trees that makes one unconsciously begin humming the ancient homes of england how beautiful they stand amidst the tall ancestral trees over all the pleasant land oh you'll get much better roads than this in the southern counties is the reply though fresh from american roads one can scarce see what shape the improvements can possibly take out of lancashire into cheshire we wheel and my escort after wishing me all manner of good fortune in hearty lancashire style wheel about and hie themselves back toward the rumble and roar of the world's greatest seaport leaving me to pedal pleasantly southward along the green lanes amid the quiet rural scenery of staffordshire to stone where i remain sunday night the country is favoured with another drenching downpour of rain during the night and moisture relentlessly descends at short unreliable intervals on monday morning as i proceed toward birmingham notwithstanding the superabundant moisture the morning ride is a most enjoyable occasion requiring but a dash of sunshine to make everything perfect the mystic voice of the cuckoo is heard from many an emerald copse around songsters that inhabit only the green hedges and woods of merry england are carolling their morning vespers in all directions skylarks are soaring soaring skyward warbling their unceasing pains of praise as they gradually ascend into cloudland's shadowy realms and occasionally i bowl along beneath an archway of spreading beeches that are colonized by crowds of noisy rooks incessantly cawing their approval or disapproval of things in general surely england with its well-nigh perfect roads the wonderful greenness of its vegetation and its roadsters that meet and regard their steel-ribbed rivals with supreme indifference is the natural paradise of cyclers there is no annoying dismounting for frightened horses on these happy highways for the english horse though spirited and brimful of fire has long since accepted the inevitable and either has made friends with the wheelman and his swift-winged steed or what is equally agreeable maintain a haughty reserve 
Pushing along leisurely between showers into Warwickshire, I reach Birmingham about three o'clock, and after spending an hour or so looking over some tricycle works, and calling for a leather writing case they are making especially for my tour, I wheel on to Coventry, having the company of Mr. Priest, Jr. of the Tricycle Works, as far as Stonehouse. Between Birmingham and Coventry, the recent rainfall has evidently been less, and I mentally note this fifteen-mile stretch of road as the finest traversed since leaving Liverpool, both for width and smoothness of surface, it being a veritable boulevard. Arriving at Coventry, I call on Brother Sturmey, a gentleman well and favourably known to readers of cycling literature everywhere, and, as I feel considerably like deserving reasonably gentle treatment after perseveringly pressing forward sixty miles in spite of the rain, I request him to steer me into the Cyclists' Touring Club Hotel, an office which he smilingly performs, and thoughtfully admonishes the proprietor to handle me as tenderly as possible. I am piloted around to take a hurried glance at Coventry, visiting, among other objects of interest, the Starley Memorial. This memorial is interesting to cyclers, from having been erected by public subscription in recognition of the great interest Mr. Starley took in the cycle industry, he having been, in fact, the father of the interest in Coventry, and consequently the direct author of the city's present prosperity. The mind of the British small boy along my route has been taxed to its utmost to account for my white military helmet, and various and interesting are the passing remarks heard in consequence. The most general impression seems to be that I am direct from the Sudan, some youthful conservatives blandly intimating the Starley Memorial Coventry that I am the advance guard of a general scuttle of the army out of Egypt, and that presently whole regiments of white-helmeted wheelmen will come whirling along the roads on nickel-plated steeds, some even going so far as to do me the honour of calling me General Wolseley, while others, rising young liberals probably, recklessly call me General Gordon, intimating by this that the hero of Khartoum was not killed after all, and is proving it by sweeping through England on a bicycle, wearing a white helmet to prove his identity. A pleasant ride along a splendid road, shaded for miles with rows of spreading elms, brings me to the charming old village of Dunchurch, where everything seems moss-grown and venerable with age. A squatty, castle-like church tower that has stood the brunt of many centuries frowns down upon a cluster of picturesque, thatched cottages of primitive architecture and ivy-clad from top to bottom, while to make the picture complete there remain even the old wooden stocks through the holes of which the feet of boozy unfortunates were wont to be unceremoniously thrust in the good old times of rude simplicity. In fact, the only really unprimitive building about the place appears to be a newly erected Methodist chapel. It couldn't be. No. Of course it couldn't be possible that there is any connecting link between the American peculiarity of elevating the feet on the window sill or the drum of the heating stove, and this old-time custom of elevating the feet of those of our ancestors possessed of boozy, hilarious proclivities. At Weedon Barracks I make a short halt to watch the soldiers go through the bayonet exercises and suffer myself to be persuaded into quaffing a mug of delicious creamy stout at the canteen with a genial old sergeant, a bronzed veteran who has seen active service in several of the tough expeditions that England seems ever prone to undertake in various uncivilized quarters of the world. 
after which I wheel away over old Roman military roads through Northamptonshire and Buckinghamshire, reaching Fenny Stratford just in time to find shelter against the machinations of the weather clerk, who, having withheld rain nearly all the afternoon, begins dispensing it again in the gloaming. It rains uninterruptedly all night, but although my route for some miles is now down cross-country lanes, the rain has only made them rather disagreeable, without rendering them in any respect unridable, and although I am among the slopes of the Chiltern Hills, scarcely a dismount is necessary during the forenoon. Spending the night at Berkhamstead, Hertfordshire, I pull out toward London on Thursday morning, and near Watford am highly gratified at meeting Fayed and the captain of the North London Tricycle Club, who have come out on their tricycles from London to meet and escort me into the metropolis. At Fayed's suggestion, I decide to remain over in London until Saturday to be present at the annual tricycle meet on Barnes Common, and together we wheel down the Edgware Road. Park Road, among the fashionable turnouts of Piccadilly, past Knightsbridge and Brompton, to the Inventories Exhibition, where we spend a most enjoyable afternoon inspecting the thousand and one material evidences of inventive genius from the several countries represented. Five hundred and twelve cyclers, including forty-one tandem tricycles and fifty ladies, ride in procession at the Barnes Common Meet, making quite an imposing array as they wheel two abreast between rows of enthusiastic spectators. Here, among a host of other wheeling celebrities, I am introduced to Major Knox Holmes, before mentioned as being a gentleman of extraordinary powers of endurance considering his advanced age. After tea, a number of tricyclers accompany me down as far as Croydon, which place we enter to the pattering music of a drenching rainstorm, experiencing the accompanying pleasure of a wet skin, etc. The threatening aspect of the weather on the following morning causes part of our company to hesitate about venturing any farther from London, but Fayed and three companions wheel with me toward Brighton through a gentle morning shower, which soon clears away, however, and before long the combination of the splendid Sussex roads, fine breezy weather and lovely scenery amply repays us for the discomforts of yester eve. Fourteen miles from Brighton we are met by eight members of the Kempton Rangers Bicycle Club, who have sallied forth thus far northward to escort us into town. Having done which, they deliver us over to Mr. C. of the Brighton Tricycle Club and brother-in-law to the mayor of the city. It is two in the afternoon. This gentleman straightway ingratiates himself into our united affections and wins our eternal gratitude by giving us a regular wheelman's dinner, after which he places us under still further obligations by showing us as many of the lions of Brighton as are accessible on Sunday, chief among which is the famous Brighton Aquarium, where, by his influence, he kindly has the diving birds and seals fed before their usual hour for our especial delectation a proceeding which naturally causes the barometer of our respective self-esteems to rise several notches higher than usual, and doubtless gives equal satisfaction to the seals and diving birds. We linger at the aquarium until near sundown, and it is fifteen miles by what is considered the smoothest road to Newhaven. Mr. C. declares his intention of donning his riding suit and by taking a shorter, though supposably rougher road, reach New Haven as soon as we, as we halt at Lewis for tea, and ride leisurely, likewise submitting to being photographed en route, he actually arrives there ahead of us. It is Sunday evening, May the 10th, 
and my ride through merry England is at an end. Among other agreeable things to be ever remembered in connection with it is the fact that it is the first three hundred miles I ever remember riding over without scoring a header, a circumstance that impresses itself none the less favourably, perhaps, when viewed in connection with the solidity of the average English road. It is not a very serious misadventure to take a flying header into a bed of loose sand on an American country road, but the prospect of rooting up a flint stone with one's nose, or knocking a curbstone loose with one's bump of cautiousness, is an entirely different affair. Consequently, the universal smoothness of the surface of the English highways is appreciated at its full value by at least one wheelman whose experience of roads is nothing if not varied. Comfortable quarters are assigned me on board the channel steamer, and a few minutes after bidding friends and England farewell at Newhaven at 11.30 p.m., I am gently rocked into unconsciousness by the motion of the vessel, and remain happily and restfully oblivious to my surroundings until awakened next morning at Dieppe, where I find myself in a few minutes on a foreign shore. All the way from San Francisco to New Haven, there is a consciousness of being practically in one country and among one people, people who, though acknowledging separate governments, are bound so firmly together by the ties of common instincts and interests, and the mystic brotherhood of a common language and a common civilization, that nothing of a serious nature can ever come between them. But now I am verily among strangers, and the first thing talked of is to make me pay duty on the bicycle. End of section 9